Neuroeconomics is a, is a very recent scientific endeavor that seeks to understand how we make decisions. And in particular, how our biology supports and constrains decision making. And what I mean by this is how our brain processes decisions and the types of computation that go into decision making. And um, by constraints, I mean the types of limitations that our neural system imposes on decision making. So there are a number of things that we cannot do, which is, for instance, if we have a lot of choice options, uh, we cannot always consider all of them in our computations. Even if we consider just simple decision making, it's a relatively complex process compared to other things that are studied, for instance, in cognitive and effective neuroscience. So decision making involves multiple stages and they include, at a minimum, forming a perceptual representation of the choice space. So the kinds of things that we're making decisions about, we have to be able to, to represent them and understand what they are, the things that we're deciding over. Um, then we perform a number of computations, basically to estimate the value of the different choice options, which then have to be compared to come to a decision. And finally, we have to communicate our decision to the environment. And this means basically that we have to plan and execute some form of action to obtain the, the choices um, that, or the, the outcomes that we've chosen. And in the case of, for instance, um, choosing something for dinner, this might mean walking to a restaurant. In the case of the experiments that are typically conducted in neuroeconomics, this typically involves just simply pressing a button because neuroeconomists simplify a lot of these things in their experiments to, to have more control over what subjects are doing. And then finally, at the final stage of this decision-making cascade, if you will, we receive the outcome and we get an experience with what we have decided to take. Um, this might be, for instance, when we choose from a menu at a restaurant, we chose one particular meal and we have a certain expectation about this meal. And then we actually, when we actually get it served, it might exceed our expectations, which is a good thing or it might be less good than we predicted, which is then obviously a bad thing. And um, by having experiences with the outcomes of our decisions, we can learn about them and update our expectations for the future in order to make better decisions. And this has been referred to as the reward prediction error in um, the animal learning um, field. So there, there are actually many questions that neuroeconomists ask. And just to give you an example of some of them, um, New economists try to understand how uncertainty and risk influence our choices and obviously how the brain processes these. So what is the neural system that supports risk estimates, for instance? And um, this obviously has applications in real life. For instance, why do we play the lottery? Why do we purchase insurance? Another question is, how does time influence our decisions? So many decisions that we make um, actually in daily life, they play out over time. Um, and those decisions include, for instance, whether to exercise right now, which is something that's effortful at the moment, but over time this leads to obviously better physical health, um, what types of things to eat. So very rewarding in the, in the moment is to eat a cake, a piece of cake or an ice cream, which is sweet and sugary and tastes great. But in the long run, if this is all we ate, then we would probably get pretty big and unhealthy. So this is what's called um, an intertemporal decision. But it also affects financial decisions, such as um, whether to save now or whether to spend money now. Whatever you're saving right now is something that you cannot spend, but you might have a bigger amount of money to spend in the future for a house or something like this. Another question that neuroeconomists ask is, um, how do you make decisions in social contexts? so when other people are involved, um, when our decisions affect the outcome of other people? And the questions that we ask there are, what makes us trust another person and what are the neural systems that support trust and what makes us perform an altruistic action, which is basically um, giving up some of our time and resources to help other people be better off in the end. These are actually questions that have been asked for quite some time now in different fields and different disciplines of science. And they include psychology, behavioral economics and cognitive and effective neuroscience. But in each field, these, these decisions have been approached from a different angle, from a different point of view, basically, and using very different methodologies. 
Now, what neuroeconomics does for the first time is it offers an interdisciplinary approach using basically methods and viewpoints, uh, theories, from all of these different fields, which gives a new perspective on, on these types of questions. Obviously, one of these perspectives being how the brain processes these types of decisions that we're interested in. So this gives the researcher access to multiple methodologies, um, such as um, tasks from behavioral economics that have been developed and are very well established over the time, but also methods from neuroscience, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, which measures the neural correlates um, of these types of decisions. Um, using the Bolt response. It's called the blood oxygenation level response. And that's a correlate of, of neural activity. Um, but also we have other methods that, that can be used, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a way to stimulate particular regions in the brain and thereby inhibit the activity in these regions or enhance the activity in these regions, so leading to less and more contributions of these brain regions which gives scientists the, uh, uh, a way to look at the causal contribution of particular regions on decision making. So basically this, this novel approach, neuroeconomics, is highly interdisciplinary and uses multiple methods and um, allows researchers to peek into the brain and to manipulate the brain as well while people are making decisions either in social contexts or in financial contexts. So one of the things that people have been studying in behavioral economics for a long time is uh, our risk preferences. So how we deal with basically risks in the decisions that we're taking, which happens in daily life quite commonly. Uh, and this has led, amongst others, to um, the Nobel Prize winning work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who developed a, a novel theory called prospect theory based on their work. And uh, one example that's commonly used to explain to people what the participants in neuroeconomics experiments do in the experiments is the following. So imagine that you're the participant of a game show that's called Deal or No Deal. And this is actually a TV show that's uh, being broadcast around the world um, in different countries. And what happens in this TV show? Um, the participant enters a room and in front of him are 20 suitcases laid out. And each of these suitcases contains a certain amount of money. And the amounts of money, they range between one euro in the European version of the show up until one million euro. And the participant, participant picks one suitcase from this row of suitcases and takes it to his desk, puts it on his desk, and that's the one that he might take home at the end of the game. From this point on starts a process of elimination so the participant then starts opening the different suitcases to reveal what types of monetary amounts are not in the suitcase that he has chosen um, until only a couple of suitcases are, uh, are um, not being opened at the end of the game. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that there's also a banker who wants to persuade the participant to walk home with his suitcase, basically, because the one million euros might be in that suitcase and the banker does not want to lose his one million euros. So he calls at different intervals throughout the game and he makes a counter offer. So he says, if you stop the game right now and walk home without the suitcase in front of you, which might after all contain one million euros, um, I will give you some amount of money. And depending on what was opened throughout the game, the offer goes up or down. So imagine that you've been playing this game for some time and every time you as the participant rejected the offer of the banker and you're left with two suitcases. One suitcase that's lying over there somewhere and one suitcase that's lying right in front of you. And you know that the two amounts that are still in the game are one euro and 500,000 euros. So you might have the suitcase with 500,000 euros in front of you, which is great, but you might not. So then at this point the banker calls and says, I'm going to give you 100,000 euros now if you simply go home and leave the suitcase lying there. So your choice is uh, between a 50% chance of one euro and a 50% chance of 500,000 euros if you want to basically gamble or a certain amount of 100,000 euros.
So the question is, what would you do? And what most people actually do is they choose option B, which is they just take the offer from the banker and go home. Because this is a significant amount of money that can change your life. You can maybe buy a house from this, or you can invest it and wait a couple of years and then buy a house. Um, in any case, most people would take this option, which is an indication of what's called risk aversion. And this is basically how behavioral economics experiments proceed. So participants in, in these types of experiments, they're offered multiple choices between a lottery, which offers you some chance of winning a large amount, but some chance of winning a smaller amount, and a sure win. And then participants make multiple choices of this type in our experiments. And obviously this can be done while um, brain responses are being recorded from them for instance, using fMRI, which I described earlier. So a very famous paper was conducted by Tom et al. from the Russ Poldrake lab in America. Um, and the researchers have looked at the neural correlates of risky decision-making in, um, in this experiment, similar to what I've just outlined for this game show. The authors actually exploited a very well-known finding from behavioral economics, um, namely that people are more sensitive to losses than to gains. So financial losses basically hurt twice as much as financial gains um, feel good. Uh, and this has been shown um, previously in behavioral economics. The uh, experimenters then asked their subjects that were lying in a scanner and seeing these kinds of choices on the screen in front of them to make decisions between, well, over lotteries that offered a 50% chance of winning some amount and a 50% chance of losing some amount. And the amounts varied every time a new decision screen would come on and subjects made different types of decisions um, over and over again. And this is actually necessary to be able to estimate econometric models later on, uh, which can then be correlated with the neural responses that we're interested in. So just let me give you a quick uh, example of the lottery. So these lotteries offer a 50% chance of winning some amount, which could be 40 euros, and a 50% chance of losing some amount, which could be 2 euros. So you have a chance of gaining a lot and a chance of losing quite a little. And this is something that most people would accept and play this lottery. If the lottery changes, however, say you get a 50% chance of winning 20 euros, and a 50% chance of losing 20 euros, most people would not play this lottery. They would rather pass this and, and move on to the next uh, offer. Um, what you can then do is, if you record brain responses using fMRI, you can correlate the values on every trial, for every decision basically, with the brain activity. And what these researchers found is that there actually is a network of regions that tracks both gain amounts and loss amounts. Um, and this is in ventral striatum and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So these are two very important regions that I might mention later on again. They also found that these regions correlated more steeply with the losses compared to the gains, which is basically a re reproduction of the behavioral finding that was very well established previously, namely that losses matter more to people than gains, so they basically showed that losses matter more to the brain than gains in these specific regions that they identified. So this has actually been um, replicated multiple times now. So the first study was done in 2007, so not too long ago. But since then, many people have started doing research in neuroeconomics. And a recent meta-analysis summarized the data from over 200 studies that have looked at subjective value coding in the brain. And they've used uh, quite sophisticated statistical techniques to identify those regions that are consistently processing subjective values. So they're performing a very important computation for decision making, namely evaluating the choice options. And these results have basically confirmed what this Tom et al. study that I talked about previously um, has found, namely that there are two very important regions in the brain the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the ventral striatum that consistently um, correlate with subjective value computations. So this is a very important finding uh, that's very important for neuroeconomics because it identifies a system in the human brain that across over 200 studies um, consistently activates these types of regions and shows their importance in decision making basically.
So basically, to reiterate, research in neuroeconomics has identified a system that consistently performs computations important for decisions. And this is um, valuation, so evaluating the different choice option. And this occurs in ventral striatum and ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, but there are many new developments in this, in this field, and many other fields have started joining neuroeconomics. So people in psychiatry are now looking at how um, patients with psychiatric disorders, such as depression and anxiety, are making decisions, which is a very important thing because making decisions is actually one of the biggest problems in these types of populations. Then um, many other new um, techniques are being used, such as TMS, which I talked about earlier, and TDCS to look at the causal involvement of partic particularly brain systems in decision making. Uh, and finally, pharmacological manipulations are being used to up or down regulate entire neurotransmitter systems in the brain to, un to try to understand their involvement in decision making. So there's a lot of new research that, that is being developed at the moment and uh, there's an exciting future for research in, in neuroeconomics.